Our next session uh, this afternoon will be for about uh, nearly an hour, and there will be a cup of break, and then uh, it's not on. It's on. It's on, but it's on. Yeah. It's on. It's on. All right. I'll do with that. So we'll be having our, our break about 3.30, something like that, um, for a cup of break, and then we will continue the final session until about 4.30. So I'm going to hand you over now to our, to our two superstars at the front here, <laughs> and Francis and David. Thank you. 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 Thank Okay, is everyone having a great day? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. We're here to simplify, clarify, demystify. Yeah, make it, it we go, ah, oh, yeah, oh, that's what we want. It's not working, can you hear it? Turn it up a little. There, how's that? That's better. That's better. If it goes too loud, then it goes here. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> the people in the front row, their hair starts to fly back. <laughs> people in the back row, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, maybe we can you be able to open up with some questions. Yeah. Do you have any? There's a topic question back there. Uh, hi. Um, what the first time I want to ask is what's been troubling me recently reading Paul? Um, the, the ego doesn't want to change, it wants to stay, you know, as it is. And the Holy Spirit is eternally, you know, the higher self is eternally changeless. question is like who is the audience for the course and and what is the part that, that made the decision to come here today there we go. To turn it. the course is written in a way that um, it has to be written in almost like a ladder so that there's different metaphors that can reach the mind wherever it seems to be or whatever it seems to be identified with. So for example, um, when Jesus is really appealing to, to the mind to have a change of heart and turn around and really appealing to connect with it, he will even say things like, um, God is lonely or God is incomplete without you, when really God is never lonely or incomplete. But it's an appeal to see, wow, you are so part of God, that you are so necessary and so important. So you see how he's just using language to make an appeal. When we talk about who is the one who decided to come and um, you might also ask, who is the one that's undergoing mind training? You could say it's the sleeping mind, or the mind that has forgotten about God and heaven. Uh, it believes in separation, and needs to be reached through words and through symbols. That sleeping mind is the one that is going to be taking steps and making an approach back. And Jesus does say that consciousness is the domain of the ego and can be trained. 
And most of us are familiar with that, when we think of reaching higher states of consciousness through meditation or through various spiritual practices, we can think of, of consciousness as having levels and beginning to reach higher and higher states of consciousness. But ultimately, we must come to a place to realize that, that all of those are like metaphors because the truth really has no exceptions. So, in the end it will come down to like a, a decision in our mind of seeing we were completely wrong about everything. Everything we thought we knew. And then, salvation is described as, I do not know the thing I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going, or how to look upon myself. Which sounds like a very, uh, you might say, open, unknowing mind, and then salvation will return to the mind that has realized it's completely wrong about everything. It's like there's an opening, it is this, to this clean, unsealed, open mind that truth returns exactly as it is. So. I think it's best not to try to find an answer to your question in personal terms. Because when we look at ourselves as a person, we will never be able to understand the world or the, or the human condition. But we can stay open in our mind to being shown the most direct pathway to, to the correction or to the solution. And that takes a lot of trust. And that's what you were feeling about the, the, the problem or the answer you were sharing about learning to open up to the answer, to focus on it. you want to share? Yeah, yeah because the, the problem, a lot of the times when we think of a problem or expressing a problem, we think that that problem is something that is a fact. And all that we need to do is to try to find a solution. But the fact is, when we define a problem in our minds, it is really more a statement. When we define a problem, it's not so much a question, but a statement. And underneath the definition of a problem, there are many, many assumptions. Assumptions of, I know that who I am, I know what is the best for me, I know what this world is about, I know that there is an external world, something external of me. So there are a lot of assumptions that is supporting this question. So every time when we think of a question or we try to ask a question and try to find answer there, that's why you can see it's, it's really not going to go anywhere from that perspective. So, and the mind, of course, I, I touched upon it a little bit. When we try to analyze the problem, we try to do that because we think, if I understand the problem fully, I will find a solution. And it's up to me to find a solution. I need to find a way out. And it's very, very disorientating to the ego that to know that the solution is not up to us. Actually, I remember years ago, um, you, David, you actually said, you came to UK for a conference and then you came back and you said something to the extent that nobody will understand the course until is fully awakened. So really what we're trying to do here is not try to understand this world, not even try to understand the Course. Because the whole way that we think is faulty. So it does take a lot of trust for us to let go this temptation to define our problems, define our lives, and try to find a solution by ourselves. 
the solution is actually given. You know, David said, of course, I actually mentioned, you have received many answers that you, have, that you haven't heard. So the solutions are given moment to, to moment to guide us, to guide the sleeping mind, gradually waking up to realize <coughs> his true identity and starting from practical guidance seemingly in this life because the mind is so fixated, fixated on this seeming individual identity and life. That's where it starts. But all of this guidance and following is really coming back to allow the mind to start to receive the answer, the answer, the one answer. But it seems to take many, many forms, you know. That is a habit that we're going to start to practice, to form. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, judge not. And so one of the questions that comes up is, how do I go from a judgmental mind into a pristine, clear, pure expression of light? How do I go from a, an addictive, judgmental mind into this pristine, pure state of mind that is the Christ? It's almost like, how do you go from darkness to light. And the Holy Spirit is the bridge. The Holy Spirit will seem to take the form of a voice, not in eternity, because there's, there's no voices in eternity. That's the ego. When the committee meets in your mind, and you hear the committee meeting, you go, oh, here we go again. And the committee never agrees. Oh, the committee's got a lot of opinions going on in there, and well, but be practical. Think of this and this and this. And on the pro side, but on the con side, you know, it's all, the committee is never agreeing. But there are no committees in heaven. So, how do you go from judgment into a pristine state of, of <coughs> spirit? You go there through the Holy Spirit. So, it's almost like saying, I'm lost. But Holy Spirit, you are with me in my mind, and now you will take the form of giving me your judgments, so that I can reach above to a state of pure non-judgment. So what are the Holy Spirit's judgments, if the judgments are the bridge from an addicted judging mind, to Holy Spirit judgments, to non-judgment? The Holy Spirit's judgments are your guidance. Go here. Go there. Call so and so. Write this down. You know, the, that's the specific guidance. The Holy Spirit taking specific form to reach the complicated ego mind to transcend judgment entirely. So, instead of just thinking that, that you should be still, you should be quiet, you should have a quiet mind, when you follow the workbook lessons, it is clearing the debris away, so you can follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The only purpose of A Course in Miracles is to put you in touch with your internal teacher. And that's why in A Course in Miracles it said, this course is a beginning and not an end. So you don't have to think, I'm going to be working with this course all my life. You can be thinking, I'm just going to work with this course until I'm in touch with my internal teacher. Then I'll go on with my next level of lessons. You see, you're not tied to a book, you're actually going to use a book to become highly intuitive, to be highly in touch with your higher self. And that's when it gets quite enjoyable, because a lot of the uh, parables that I share and that Francis shares, we share, are, are parables to inspire and bless that are very practical, that still seem to do with dealing with the symbols of the world. It's still, if you're given a, a teaching function or a travel function like we've been given, there are lots of experiences with people and 
organizations and, and venues and airlines and rail, railway and buses and all kinds of things that then can become inspiring parables that lets you know that you can live a life of ease and flow even relating to the world, seemingly the world. But the more that you follow the guidance, the less you feel like you're in the world. More like you're dreaming it, like you're watching it. Which is wonderful. A lot of us have had the experience of a lucid dream. And isn't a lucid dream a lot of fun? You may have a dragon or a monster in front of you and you just are so happy because you <laughs> know you're dreaming the monster and you're not at the mercy of the monster. It's very empowering. That's the, that's the result of guidance. That's the result of practicing the guidance. And so, for me, that's been the most important thing and the most convincing thing with the Course has been 30 years ago the Course came into my life. And then about 25 years ago is when Jesus said, okay now, let go of your career, let go of your jobs, let go of everything in your life. You are mine now, and we're going on an adventure, and I will lead you. I will tell you where to go, what to do, who to meet. I will give you practical guidance. And so, to me, that's when things really kicked into gear 25 years ago where I wasn't just reading and studying the book. I was like, okay, I'm here, you guide, I will follow. Because getting in touch with your internal teacher will bring you into that place of willingness to be guided through experiences that show you that you're the dreamer of the dream. That show you that you are not at the mercy of the world. That you are dreaming the world which is very empowering. And no one will wake up from the dream until they have an experience of being the dreamer of the dream. You cannot wake up from someone else's dream. So if you have, believe you have an enemy, or an arch enemy, that's always bothering you, you're never going to wake up from their dream. They're just a figure in the dream. They were just acting out a grievance, giving you an opportunity to forgive the grievance. They never did anything to you, they were simply acting out what you believed you did to yourself. Now, earlier we, the idea came up of sin. How does sin relate to all this? Sin, we know from the Aramaic, is missing the mark. Not some kind of black mark on your soul, it's just missing the mark. And the belief that you can separate from God comes down to a question of authorship. And the question is this, am I the author of myself, or was I authored by God? Is God my author, or do I author myself? If God is the author, I am spirit. Because God is spirit and God authors in spirit. If I am the author of myself, it's like saying to God, hold on there, I want to make myself up any way I want to be. I want to try out being male, female, masculine, feminine. I want to try out being this culture, that culture. You know, all of what we could call reincarnation, what's under reincarnation is the belief that I can be the author of myself. And keep remaking myself, and reinventing myself, over and over and over again, in form. And you see, that's the core issue. Who is my author? And if some of you watch my YouTubes, I do have a YouTube titled, Who's Your Daddy? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about in that, that video. Who is my creator? 
on earth, as a human being, it seems like we have physical parents. But we have a divine parent who authors us in spirit, and we can't be both. We can't be both physical and spiritual. One is temporary and one is eternal. So you see, that's the core issue in the mind, is really, who is my author? Who is my creator? Who is my source? And when it gets confused on the horizontal level, like with mom and dad, there's going to be guilt. Who among us haven't had grievances with our parents? We think of teenagers saying sometime to their parents, why, did you, why was I born? Why did you even have me and bring me into such a crazy world? <laughs> you see, the guilt gets projected in terms of the flesh. But, but the solution goes much deeper. It goes way down into the mind. So this is the core issue. It's really an identity issue. Every time you have an upset of any kind, it's really, it's still, am I the author of myself? Or was I authored by God? And Jesus, the way shower, you might remember back from the Bible where Jesus said, Why do you call me good? This is Jesus Christ speaking. Why do you call me good? God. He always was pointing back to the author. He was always pointing to the author. He was never pointing to a personal sense of self. He was always pointing back at the Creator. And that's humble. That's, that's, what you, that's appropriate. Jesus even says, awe is not a, an appropriate emotion with me. Awe should be reserved only for God. And there was a time when Helen Schuckman went into a, a Catholic church and Bill came in, and they were kneeling down uh, in the church, in the pews and everything, and suddenly Jesus appeared. And Jesus came down to where they were kneeling, and He kneeled down beside Helen and Bill. Isn't that beautiful? It's like washing the feet of the Apostles. Jesus is our, is with us. He's like us in every way except for one, and that's time. He's accomplished, he's transcended time, but he's equal with us in every way. And when we transcend time, we go, ha, oh, you're me. <laughs> I've been the Christ all along, but I was simply sleeping, and I forgot who I was, and who authored me. Yes? Don't you, like, seem to be completely awakened, or really awakened? I'm not sure which. I want that. How many others uh, are there? <laughs> you don't have it. Like, how long? <laughs> you know, I want what you've got, and you don't see it much. And all the poor teachers I've seen over the years, you don't really see it really embodied and, and carried and lived so much. So I, do you think it might be even more like that? <laughs> well, first of all, I, what I teach is there's only one of us. <laughs> so, so it's not like some bodies have got it and some bodies don't. The, the uh, persons don't wake up. It's, it's like a state of mind that, that sees we're not persons and never have been persons. And so it's, it's very natural, it's very friendly, it's very humble, it's, it's, it's very inviting, it's playful, it's cheerful, it will sing songs, it will, you know, it's just so glorious, and yet it, it cannot be attached or attributed to a body, anybody. And even with Jesus, you know, there's, there's a couple places in the Course where Jesus comes out and says, Forgive me your illusions. And people have, you know, he's speaking in the first person and they're going, wait a minute, that, that threw me for a loop. I mean, I can see if my mother said forgive me or my child or whatever, but Jesus Christ, 
He shouldn't be saying that. He shouldn't, Jesus shouldn't be saying, forgive me. <laughs> that, I'm getting a little concerned when Jesus says, forgive me. Well, all he's really saying is, forgive the man, forgive the apostles, forgive Mary, Mary Magdalene, forgive all of history, and accept yourself as the living Christ. He, when he says, forgive me, he's saying, now you've got to pull it off of the character of Jesus even. Because the Jesus was a man, and we know that Christ is not a man or a woman. And we know that Christ is, is a pure idea in the mind of God, it's not masculine or feminine. So we have no reference point except to say, okay, I, I, I will let that go too. I, I will not pin you to a man that lived 2,000 years ago. Uh, some of you know that they keep coming out with Jesus movies. You know, we've had The Greatest Story Ever Told, and Jesus of Nazareth, and Temp Last Temptation of Christ, and all these Jesus movies. Recently we've had a couple, um, we've got one very recently called The Young Messiah, which is amazing. You start to see a young Jesus with these amazing, miraculous powers, and that's pretty good. But then right before that was a movie called Risen. And the, the scene that I remember from Risen was a Roman centurion who's trying to find the body of Jesus is questioning the apostles. They find Mary Magdala, they find the apostles. And at one point, this Roman centurion is really questioning this apostle. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? They're trying to find the body of Jesus to prove, you know, that, that he's dead. And he doesn't live. And finally, the Apostle just looks at the Roman Centurion and says, If I tell you the truth, will you let me free? And the Roman says, yes. Where is Jesus? He, you know, he has to know where is the body of Jesus. And the Apostle finally looks at the Roman in the eyes and says, He's everywhere! And he flies out the door. <laughs> and the Roman has this look. He's everywhere. With glee, he's everywhere. In other words, don't worry about the body of Jesus. Jesus, the Christ, is everywhere. And that is what you're wanting to tune into. You want to tune into that feeling like it's, like it's everywhere. It's unstoppable. It's radiant. It's glorious. So, Ultimately, I would say, a good teacher will, will teach him or herself out of a job. In other words, in this world we, we have teachers and we think that they have careers, but ultimately the purpose of teaching is to teach yourself out of a job. To teach yourself into an experience of who you are, and out of words, and out of time. And so, we encourage everyone to, to link in and join in like you're doing right now. Like all I hear you saying is, I, this is everything. This is everything to me. And we're like, yes, isn't this, we're rejoicing. Yes, yes, this is everything. And then all we can do is, is share from our hearts what the Spirit sharing through us, what worked, what, what was our focus, uh, what did we give our attention to? And what did we pull our attention away from? Uh, you can't convince anybody, there's no one to convince. And so that's another aspect of, of awakening or enlightenment is, you reach such a state of contentment and joy, that you realize there's nobody and no thing to convince. It's, it's like you rest in God, you rest in an experience. And to do that, you just, you have to have a desire for it, and you have to give yourself permission to let go of all egoic responsibilities. And that is one of the keys we could talk about. Because the ego has made up a whole world of false responsibilities to keep you from your one responsibility of accepting the atonement. How many of us have given ourselves times to pray and meditate, to take it easy, and the more relaxed we get, 
and the more joyful and loving we feel that there's this other voice in our mind that comes in and says, Come on, quit messing around and do some work. Why don't you be productive and get off your lazy ass? <laughs> you see, this voice is so terrified of stillness and rest that it's going to try to counter our permission to be still with this false sense of you owe this, you, you owe this, you're responsible for this, you're responsible for that. And that's probably one of the greatest temptations that has to be faced is this sense of, of false responsibility. So that's been something in our lives, I know I've had to face it and for Francis as well. I was telling a group recently, I said if you had like a thesaurus or a, a workbook glossary or dictionary of awakening, they, you could put Francis's picture, smiling face next to the awakening, because she saw the road before her, which was stepping out of the pursuit of all the things the world says you should pursue, and she just said, no thank you, because Francis was was married, she had her own business, she was successful as the world judges successful. It's the thing that the seven billion are going towards, you know, like this piece of cheese at the end of the rainbow that you're supposed to like work hard for decades and hope, hope that you get there. She already was there at that point, but there was an emptiness inside. Underneath all that success, there was an emptiness. Academic success, financial success, success of career, married, properties. You know, it was like, oh, ding, 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 as the world would say, ooh, you hit, you rang the bell on all the things that you're supposed to ring the bell on. And coming to the heights of, of that success, there was an emptiness, there was still that hole in the soul that was going, Something is missing. Even though I've achieved and accomplished and I've attained, as the world would say, there's something that's still not satisfied. As the British poet Mick Jagger once said, I can't get no satisfaction. Or something still, even with all the success that was still not satisfied, and then the journey begins in earnest, because then the pursuits are no longer going to be there. Then comes the pursuit of going inside. And the pursuit takes a lot of um, dedication and commitment, because I can tell you every step along the way, the ego will come in in some form to say, don't keep going because you have responsibility in this world. And um, I remember, so, I don't, I lose count, so, so many times, how many times along this pathway, this kind of responsibility comes up. And when I was still believing in that, it came with a lot of guilt. Because um, one of the examples that I, that I can remember right now is uh, when I chose to leave Australia and come to to the uh, United States to practice this way of living full time. Um, my mother just got the approval to live in Australia with like equivalent of a, a green card to live with me for the rest of her life. From China. From China. And she went through this two years of application process, and right before I was about to go, she got approval. And she was about to pay, they, because of her age, the government, Australian government, requested that she pay some $20,000, and as a guarantee, then, then she can go. If she let that go, she probably never had the chance to get it again, you know. So she was telling me 
I want to live with you. We went through this for two years. Do I pay this $20,000 or not? If I don't, I'll never be able to live with you again. Are you sure this is what you're doing? Aren't you, are you certain you never come back? I wasn't. I, I didn't know. I was going into the unknown. I had no clue of where this pathway was leading. There was absolutely no guarantee. And with all of these questions in the mind, there's no guarantee and the guilt and the responsibility. All that I could say was, I can, you know, make decisions on your own. Don't count on me. That's the only thing I can say. That's the honest thing I can say is, don't count on me. Make the decision for yourself, because I'm making decisions now to go for my happiness, and I'm going to be responsible for the choice that I'm making. So you can be responsible for the choice that you're making too. So she did, she paid, and um, yeah, so it's been more than five years now. She hasn't. But the thing is, I can't remember how many times I was trying to convince her to believe in what I was doing. And the more I was trying to do that, the more frustrated she got and to the extent she really wanted to bring me to a psychiatrist, <laughs> check my mind. And there was no point that I could, you know, convince her. But just as I become, I just thought, okay, I give up in convincing the world to agree with me or convincing her or to ease my guilt, I have to commit to my own responsibility about my mind. I have to change my mind and dedicate to that. So, so over the years, the more I'm dedicated to my mind, I keep going, the more certain I become in my own mind, then she starts to reflect that. She really starts to reflect that. And I remember there was one point she we, we met again and she came to visit me somewhere and she was so sub, like riveted by the peace that she felt with me she was like what have you been doing can you tell me exactly what you have been doing because you change you change i said i i don't know i can't describe yes you change then i sent her to the airport I was standing there and help her check in, and then she wrote an email to me. She said, you know, they upgraded me to business class because of you. I said, I didn't do anything. I didn't even speak. I just stood there by her. She said, no, it's you. It's you. It's you. <laughs> it's you. And, and she was so surprised, she, you know, over the years. Now she's at the point, she said, can you be my teacher? But really what are we teaching like i can't really teach her with my words but the more that i'm dedicated to my only responsibility she reflects that so immediately with this you know this dedication to to reflect okay thank you for being peaceful thank you can you teach me you know that is that is how the world works really they reflect back our dedication, they reflect back our devotion. So it's really because yes, um, recently actually I was talking to a friend and um, we were, she, she was basically talking, she had a lot of emotions because there was some kind of um, argument that she was involved in and she was saying, you know, she was made wrong and she felt guilty and she didn't know what to do to get out of this emotion because she felt so guilty and why why is this person keep making her wrong and that is a question of do i want to know the problem or do i want to know the answer because i said well so when you were made wrong and when you feel guilty your mind is calling for love right she said, yeah, yeah, my mind is calling for love. But he, 
It's like, okay, your mind is calling for love. And the only thing, the only solution for call for love is love. You agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the only way that we can bring the awareness of love to our mind is by giving it. Like, okay, yeah. So it becomes very simple because she has been going through a long time of allowing the emotions coming up. So she's, she has no problem. She's not suppressing it. But after we have been really allowing the emotion to come up, it started to become a practice to accept the answer. You know, the, the problem would be how to stop this from happening, whose fault it is. But the answer is the only solution to a call for love is love. And the only way to bring it back is by extending it. So the best question in that moment, instead of why do you make me feel this way, how do I stop you, why, what's your motivation, is how can I s start extending love in this moment, what is truly helpful. Because when we perceive someone call for love, or we perceive someone extending love, they have the same effect on us. The ego wouldn't say that. The ego would say that's the opposite effect. Because someone extending love makes me happy. Someone calls for love through projection, through anger, through attack, make me feel hurt. So it's opposite. But the Holy Spirit says, no, they have the same effect. The same effect is they give you an opportunity to allow love to your awareness. And to because of that, you owe your brother immense gratitude. And if that is clear, then there is really no difference. You know, there is no need to define specific problem. It is in this moment, how can we remember the solution and give that solution? over and over and over again. That's the practical application of accepting the answer. It does take practice. You know, the mind is, is you know, having a momentum of jumping into the questions, but that is our, that's going to be our practice. We just were in Portugal last week, and uh, we had we met a friend two years ago when we first went there. And this friend just um, started a business with a machine called the Quantum Machine, and uh, she just started a month ago. And she said, "Well, you know, we we can do a session." So she hooked the machine onto us, and. Um, it's very interesting because the machine supposedly is reading all your problems on the screen. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was lying there and a friend, she was reading it, she was like taking a long time reading it. And there was no explanation and then she said, okay, it's all fixed. <laughs> and it's like such a symbolic scenario because to a mind that wants to know what is wrong. This machine is not going to be very popular. Because <laughs> can you tell me what's the problem so I can find the solution on my own? And her approach is, no need to know, so fixed now. <laughs> so we were having a good laugh afterwards, saying, what a beautiful example and, and symbol. You know, we don't need to know the problem because they're not really understandable anyway. Let's focus on, okay, solutions and solutions and solutions. Yeah, that's the, to me, that's the fun of joining, like, you know, I, I love to accept invitations, and Ian Patrick invited me over here, and I've come over to England a number of times and just thoroughly enjoyed myself, and then uh, getting to be at these conferences with, with Nick and Anne, 
I just, oh, well, this is wonderful. They're so wonderful and, and such humor. Nick has humor. I mean, oh, this is so, I would love. And then we have dinner, and oh, yeah, you have to come to our uh, center sometime. You have to come to our center. There's the invitation. You see how naturally it flows from a sense of connection and joy and love? Then invitations spring forth. Naturally, it's really the Holy Spirit in us that is doing that. And then um, it's like, yeah, yeah, sometime we'll have to do that. And then this is the, this is seemingly the fruition of that loving invitation. And and it, of course, if you know with with Nick and Ann, you know this is this is basically an extension of their life. You know, they have a house and a community that's been going on, and this for. We, we just discovered last night, it's like the oldest one in the, it goes back before the Miracles Network they started. They've been at this for a long time. It's, it's, a, it's a lifetime of devotion, and these natural invitations come forth from that heart. And then it's very natural for me to accept invitations and collaborate. You know, this is, this is like a quantum collaboration. All of us are collaborating. We've all chosen to be part of this quantum experience of all of us here together in this love and this presence. And really, that's a practical answer to what you were asking for, really calling for. Um, this is our life. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't like an activity that we do on the side. Everything, our mind is devoted to this every second of every day. Even in dreams at night, you know, we have some interesting dreams, but it's all centered around the purpose of awakening. And the way it's played out for us, just like with Nick and Ann, they have this, really it's a devoted community right here in this area. We have traveled and we meet people and we also have centers and people come maybe to take a retreat or to take some silence or to do some workshops or Sometimes it's more of an extended stay. We're all inviting and being invited and accepting invitations into an experience. And it's the Spirit that's behind it. The Spirit's doing it all. Jesus is arranging time and space for all of us. We're calling on truth and love and time and space is being rearranged for us to experience that truth and love. There's really nothing personal going on. We can't really Nobody can claim credit for it in a personal way, because it's a vast plan. Uh, one time, uh, Helen Schuckman, who was the scribe of the Course, you know, she was a research psychologist, and she was starting to learn about Jesus from, through his dictations, and Edgar Cayce, and so here was a research psychologist, and Bill as well, they were looking into things like reincarnation, and, and astrology, and different things like that, which is beyond their, uh, their academic training. But at one point, you know, when Helen started to dabble in astrology, she decided to ask uh, Jesus. She said, uh, I don't get this astrology thing, she said to Jesus. I don't understand how, the, how these stars and constellations, you know, have anything to do with, with human behavior in the lives of human beings. Uh, can you give me a little bit of an insight on that? And basically Jesus said, yep, yeah, your mind is moving all those human beings on the planet around, and behind that it's moving all the stars and planets around. Well, I read that, I just about fell off <laughs> my chair. I was like, whoa! <laughs> As I'm just reading the passage, I almost got knocked off my chair. because. His explanation was so empowering, like, wow, well, there's really just one of us, and all of these bodies are moving around, and what we think of are the constellations and the astrological constellations are intimately tied in to our lives, because it's all part of the projection, and there's one mind that's moving it all. Well, that, that's very empowering if you just begin to go with that, you start to say, wow, that means it's really all working together for my good. That means that nothing has ever really happened against me, that everything that seemed to occur was always happening for me. That there's a divine plan behind all of this, that it's always working together for my good. Whether I'm aware of it or not, 
There's a blessing behind everything. Practically speaking, you know, we invite. I mean, as soon as Francis had this experience of coming for a week, I did a week retreat up in Noosa, Australia, she was just like, okay, this is it. This is my life. I, I'm putting everything into this. I'm going to go completely into this. And then she had the means to, she just started to look on the internet to see where I was teaching. This country, that country, here, there, this and that. I, she was showing up at all the gatherings. Show up here, I'm in this country. There she is again. There she is again. There she is again. You see, that's how, that was her first steps, was she just felt a strong resonance and connection, so she just thought, I'm, I'm going to go participate in that, actively participate, and she had the means to do that. And then, at some point, she came over to the monastery, of Course in Miracles Monastery that we have in Utah, and, and even that was like an immersion, uh, because it was going off to a far-off land and going out to a desert, a desert in Utah. That's interesting, from your life in Sydney, and now you're off in a desert in Utah, doing God knows what, uh, out there. But, but feeling a resonance, feeling like that was where the invitation was, and, and feeling a draw to it. And that's the way that it works. We, we follow the, the steps, we follow the invitations, and we see that there are many invitations that are there for us. If we, if we stay open, we just follow those happy invitations. I never planned to travel in 40 countries, I just kept getting invited by happy people. I mean, how do you say no to that? You know, really, it's like happy invitation. Okay. Have you ever been there? No, but it's a happy invitation. So then I answered a lot of happy invitation, and I followed, and, and then that was part of me getting happier and happier. And then the funny thing about happiness is when you start to really get happy for no earthly reason, people want to hang out with you. People want to live with you. They're in your living room. 20, 25 people in your living room before you know it. Uh, and they start living with you. And you're like, wow, I never saw that one coming. Uh, but I, I do feel happy, and uh, they seem to be getting pretty happy too. And so you start to realize there is a plan of happiness, there is a plan of joy. You know, happiness attracts happiness. And then the more happy you get, the more happiness you, you know, it's like it keeps growing and growing. And you never planned it that way at all. None of us grew up, you know, talking to our parents about, at the dinner table, okay, pass the peas, and tell me more about this plan of happiness. Uh, parents are like, yeah, that's the only reason you're here, is to become happy. Don't worry about your grades, job, no, don't, you don't have to get a job. Be inspired, be inspired, be joyful. Uh, marriage, children, well, that's okay, but be happy. You know, the most important thing is to be happy. Imagine if we, if our parents had been saying that. But Holy Spirit has been telling us that the whole time. For a millennium, we've been told we're here to be happy. We're here to experience divine ease, joy. That's that small, still voice in our mind that's always been there for us. We can ignore it, or we can listen to it. And when we listen to it, it's, it's like it sparks and triggers a momentum in us that just leads to step by step by step. So really it's it's quite easy, you know, it's when we are open to it, the invitations come. And even though our past conditioning would have us refuse some of these, we begin to, to say yes to the invitations. And what I found is there's many invitations. I, I simply was saying no to a lot of the <laughs> invitations. And Jesus was like, would you stop that? It's me. I keep giving you plenty of invitations. Why don't you say yes? And, and, and accept that it's, it's me inspiring you. It's not, nothing personal is going on. So our invitation is truly a big yes. We, we invite through what seems to be these kind of public gatherings, through many, many tools on the in internet literally hundreds and thousands of hours of resources that are sprinkled all over the internet, 
and people do find them and engage in them and have a good time with them and we love that. That's why we put them there was so people would be sparked. Uh, we could extend the same thing that we feel. Oh, comfort. Comfort time. And uh, David in the front row here bought everyone some chocolate. Oh. oh. Very, very tasty, rich chocolate. So thank you to David. And I'm going to pass these round to you. Um, you can share, share them up your comfort. And, uh, Gold bars of chocolate are all passed around. So feel free. It can be a restroom break, a chocolate break. <laughs> a little bit of everything. Yeah, I like that. <laughs>